Hey guys, welcome and welcome back to my channel. My name is Mikey. You guys are rocking with me on Mikey's Intellectual Corner. On today's episode, we are diving back into our World War One. This is 1918. This is the last one of our uh, Epic History of World War One series. So, without further ado, we're just going to dive right into it. Let's roll. <laughs> Nineteen eighteen. After three and a half years of war, the Allies are in crisis. Russia has been rocked by revolution, and its new Bolshevik government has signed an armistice with the Central Powers. Thousands of German troops will be freed up to fight on the Western Front, where the carnage of trench warfare has already claimed more than a million lives. Yeah, and unfortunately, too, I bet you like. At least half of them most likely were young and stuff, so they were most likely thinking that they were going to go home after they just essentially conquered the Eastern Front, only to be swung into the Western Front. So, kind of sad, but hey, it's what you gotta do. Has already okay. claimed more than a million lives. But Germany is also desperate. Britain's long naval blockade has led to shortages and social unrest at home. While America's entry into the war brings fresh manpower and vast resources to the Allied cause, Germany faces inevitable defeat, unless it can win a quick victory on the Western Front. US President Wilson announces his 14 points. They outline his vision for a post-war world, including an end to secret treaties, a reduction in the size of armed forces, self-determination for the people of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and an international organization to settle future disputes. But most European leaders dismiss his ideas as wishful thinking. At Brest-Litovsk, Bolshevik Russia signs a peace treaty with the Central Powers. Russia gives up vast amounts of territory in exchange for peace. Half a million German troops can now be redeployed from the east to the Western Front, where German General Erich Ludendorff plans an all-out, last-ditch offensive to win the war. Ludendorff's spring offensive catches the Allies off guard. German stormtroopers, using new infiltration tactics, help to overwhelm the British Fifth Army, which is soon in full retreat. The German advance threatens to split the British and French armies, with disastrous consequences. So French General Ferdinand Foch is appointed Supreme Commander of Allied Forces to coordinate strategy. You know, it's sad too if Germany had the help of Astro Hungarian forces and probably some Bulgarian forces, you know, just whoever to help out for this front right here, they would be good. And I'm already thinking, like, I know Austro Hungary is still fighting with uh, Italy, but they, they also just had a whole bunch of. Um, forces to free up. The same with Bulgaria, so why can't they just help out Germany over here? Like, I gotta get more into that, but if they would have, then that that front right there would have opened up for them, and they probably would have been able to break through, but yeah. And Foch is appointed Supreme Commander of Allied Forces to coordinate strategy. Outside Amiens, British and Australian troops improvise a defense, and finally halt the German advance. The German offensive switches to the north, targeting the channel ports. But the British inflict heavy losses on the Germans and prevent a breakthrough. Above the trenches, the first air war continues to escalate. Each side now has more than 3,000 aircraft in service on the Western Front, 
but by 1918, the Allies have won air superiority, thanks to greater resources. On the 21st of April, Germany's most famous pilot, Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, is shot down and killed near Amiens. With 80 victories, he's the war's highest scoring ace, and is buried by the Allies with full military. And you know, too, and that's, a, that's not the first time that um, Britain has shown uh, like a lot of uh, honors towards Germany troops and stuff like that, especially like, because you, you see that during a lot of different uh, POWs and stuff like that behind enemy, or behind their uh, camps and stuff. They would always be like, you can see them getting along and laughing and stuff like that. And, you know, just uh, pretty much just talking about like, you know, what they did before the war and stuff like that, but yeah. And is buried by the Allies with full military honours. Britain's new independent bombing force launches a daylight raid against Cologne. It marks the beginning of Britain's own strategic bombing campaign. On the ground, Ludendorff's offensive switches south, targeting the French. German troops advance 30 miles, but are halted at the River Marne, just as fresh American divisions enter the line. The US 1st Division is the first to see combat at the Battle of Cantigny. Three days later, the US 2nd Division wins victory at the Battle of Belleau Wood. By now, there are nearly a million American soldiers in France, with 10,000 more arriving every day. The fourth phase of the German offensive leads to a nine-mile advance but is finally halted by a French counter-attack. In Italy, Austria-Hungary launches an attack at Asiago and the Piave River to support Ludendorff's offensive in France. But it's repulsed with heavy losses and morale amongst the Austro-Hungarian army collapses. useless this entire war almost is for like British and French troops land at Murmansk in northern Russia it's the beginning of allied intervention in Russia's civil war on the side of so-called white or anti-bolshevik forces on the western front the Germans final attack is defeated in the second battle of the Marne Ludendorff's offensive has cost the Germans more than 600,000 casualties and has failed to make a decisive breakthrough. Germany's final gamble has failed. The Allies now go on the attack. At the Battle of Amiens, British, Australian, Canadian and it's sad too because I feel like if um, Germany at least had like just one more ally that could help them out, they would. Uh, they could at least maybe sue for peace or something like that. You know what I'm saying? At the very least, but, and they have to sign such a humiliating armistice. But yeah. The attack at the Battle of Amiens, British, Australian, Canadian, and French troops, supported by tanks and aircraft, advanced seven miles in a single day. General Ludendorff calls the 8th of August the Black Day of the German Army. German troops are exhausted, hungry and demoralised and begin to surrender in their thousands. The Battle of Amiens begins the Allies' 100 days offensive. Trench warfare is over the Germans are in full retreat. And I bet you that felt really good to not have to worry about like no man's land or, you know, different snipers, you know, like whenever they stuck their head right over the berm and stuff, having to get sniped over and all that. I bet you, all the bombardments, I bet you that felt good not to have to worry about that. In the Balkans, a new Allied offensive at Dobropolje breaks through Bulgarian positions. The overstretched Bulgarian army collapses, 
and two weeks later, Bulgaria signs an armistice. In the Middle East, British-led forces defeat the Turks at the Battle of Megiddo, taking 25,000 prisoners. Allied troops soon occupy Damascus and Aleppo. On the Western Front, Marshal Foch orders a general attack. British, French and American armies reach the Hindenburg Line, a line of reinforced German defences, and break through. Ludendorff informs the Kaiser that the military situation is hopeless and that Germany must seek an armistice. Germany sends a request to US President Woodrow Wilson, who in return demands German withdrawal from all occupied territory and the Kaiser's abdication. On the Italian front, the Allies deliver the final blow to Austria-Hungary at the Battle of Vittorio Veneto. The Austro-Hungarian army disintegrates and 300,000 prisoners are taken. Damn, but, I mean... Okay, so that's captured too. I was about to say, how the fuck do you have 435,000 freaking casualties to the annual and 37,000, but obviously 300,000 were also uh, captured. So what, that's still over 100,000 freaking uh, deaths to their, what, freaking 37,000? That's ridiculous. They should then give up. With the Central Powers facing collapse, the Ottoman Empire signs an armistice with the Allies at Mudros. Four days later, Austria-Hungary signs an armistice with the Allies at Villa Giusti. At Kiel, the German High Seas Fleet is ordered to make a suicidal attack on the British Navy. But instead, it mutinies. Revolution spreads through Germany. The Kaiser abdicates. And a German Republic is proclaimed. On the 11th of November 1918, a German delegation signs an armistice with the Allies inside Marshal Foch's railway carriage at Compiègne. It comes into force at 11 a.m., but fighting continues until the last moment. American Private Henry Gunter is killed, charging a German machine gun at 10.59. He is thought to be the last soldier killed during World War I. Three days later, if he is, then that's really cool. You know, a title to have in historic time or you know historic terms and stuff like that, and it's a really cool way to to have gone out. You know, what I'm saying at least. You know. Three days later, in East Africa, German General von Lettow Vorbeck surrenders his army on the Chambezi River. For four years, he has tied down huge numbers of Allied troops, remaining undefeated while cut off from home. He is still considered one of history's greatest guerrilla leaders. The Paris Peace Conference opens at the Palace of Versailles, just outside the French capital. Delegates accept a proposal to create a League of Nations to settle future international disputes. The Versailles Treaty, signed in June, imposes harsh terms on Germany. Its military is restricted in size. It must pay war reparations to the Allies. It loses territory to its neighbours. And its colonies are seized by the victors. Germany must also accept responsibility for the war in a war guilt clause, a source of lasting resentment in Germany. Yeah, nothing but all, 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 this, all this does is help, you know, 
set the terms or set the stage for World War II. And it's crazy to me that Germany has to accept war yet when obviously Austria-Hungary is the one who started it. And Germany shouldn't have to accept war guilt just because they were the the better of their opponents. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's ridiculous, but whatever. The boundaries of Europe are redrawn. Poland re-emerges after a hundred years of foreign rule, while Austria, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and an enlarged Romania emerge from the ashes of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Ottoman Empire is dismantled. New states, most under European control, are created in the Middle East. Here, as in Europe, the seeds of future conflict are sown. Which is crazy too, because I mean, do you guys think if like, the, if the Ottomans were still in control of the, you know, of the Middle East, do you think there would be still such, you know, conflict there? And so like, you know, be, and so would it be so bad, you know what I'm saying? While in the Far East, former German possessions in China are handed to Japan, to China's outrage. World War I claimed the lives of nine and a half million soldiers. One in eight of those who fought. 21 million more were wounded. Seven million civilians also lost their lives. Huge areas of Europe were left devastated. Old empires vanished. New states were born. Lives across the world were transformed. The world was never the same again. If you enjoyed this video, right, yeah, go ahead and end it right there. So yeah, that's another um, one in the books. That's another series in the books also. So if you guys like this one, go ahead and don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Don't forget to. Uh, join me on my next one. I'll see you guys when I see you. I'm out. Peace.